Hi, welcome. So the, this is a topic that I've felt strongly about um, for a while now. And uh, I'm glad that uh, when Dr. Leila Maruf from Kuwait University was visiting Simmons, uh, so at that point we talked about uh, various ways of collaborating. And uh, when I mentioned this idea, so she jumped in and she thought that it would be a wonderful idea. And she teaches knowledge management at, in Kuwait University, and I teach knowledge management here. So it was a good uh, selling point for us to collaborate on. So while, uh, while we all talk about knowledge management, and people might have heard of it in various ways, it, it's often now, uh, in the context of colleges and, and universities, I think, where we don't talk about it as much. And we thought that uh, there is no single paper which gives a, a template as to what, sh even if somebody wants to do it, how do you do it? And what are the steps to get started? So the idea was to try and come up with uh, some sort of a template where we give a step-by-step -step guide which people can at least follow to get started on, on knowledge management. So any uh, so this is a, a, temp a template we'll follow. I'll give you a brief overview of knowledge management. And we'll talk about uh, the problem that we're trying to solve over here, some uh, knowledge implementation models which other people have done in various organizations, and the proposed steps uh, that we propose in this uh, talk. So this is the time uh, for you to speak. Have you heard of the term, term knowledge management before? And if yes, in what context? Yeah, absolutely. I've heard it many times, but I don't know what it means. What it means, right? Mm -hmm. what, is the, what do you mean by managing knowledge, which, is, which kind, of, kind of sounds strange, right? To me, I, I, I think of it in a business context. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've uh, visited uh, Parthenon Group downtown, and there is a knowledge manager. And her goal is to collect the information that her staff, that the staff has acquired over the course of their business careers at the firm. So uh, because there's a high transition, okay. lots of turnover, uh, this way information is collected within the organization for future employees to use. So, so, so yes, you're, you're, you're correct. So it, it's basically trying to capture what's in people's heads, <laughs> right? And, and, and which, is, uh, which is difficult because people have a lot of things in their heads. But uh, the difficulty is that when we talk about knowledge, right, we think of uh, organizations, but it's really the people in that organization that makes up all the knowledge that resides in an, in an organization. And that knowledge comes in at 9 o'clock and walks out of the door at 5 p.m. <laughs> So, so pretty much, and if people were to uh, leave, which happens a lot of times, uh, especially when we talk about colleges and universities, we have staff leaving, like right now we have uh, uh, some people leaving or graduating when we have student employees. And then we have new people coming in. So a lot of times uh, there is this process of transition of trying to pass on what you know to the new people. But that is done from an individual to an individual. A lot of times, the college as a whole loses that information or does not have it in a proper way. So things are not documented in a way that, which makes it very easy for other people to take on. So that kind of organizational asset is not utilized to the best of what, what it can be. And also, the, the, the other issue is about uh, making people uh, feel valued. So how do you make people feel valued? You do that by creating a culture where it is OK to say, I don't know. So when you're not forced to be to act like, like experts, and when you can all be very free to ask questions to other people, that's when you create a knowledge sharing culture where you can reach out to people that you don't know. So even before you can get to that stage, you need to know what people know. And that's difficult because sometimes we don't know ourselves what we know. So we need to have systems and processes in place where we can map what, what we know and what our co-workers know. And then to have some sort of a directory where we can reach out to people either face-to-face -face or online based on questions that we might have. And this is supposed to be not just knowledge which is uh, transferred in the form of documents and uh, or other manuals, but something which is knowledge in, in the flux. As you get questions, you can reach out to people. Or you can reach out to best practices which other people might have done, what are the things to do at certain circumstances, and also lessons learned, what not to do in different places. So all of these are, are key things uh, which can be done in organizations. So Larry Prusak, uh, he defined knowledge management as an attempt to rec recognize what is essentially a human asset buried in the minds of individuals, and how you can make that into an organizational asset, which can be accessed and used 
So this must be accessed and used when it is needed. So sometimes we create trainings and we create, uh, let's say we have new tools like, like Moodle or any other tools which the university gets, and then we want people to be able to use it. But you might be accessing it at 2 a.m. at home. So you, you need uh, help at that, at that moment, whereas the help desk might close at 6 p.m. So it's not really helpful at that, at that moment. So how to create things where people can access things when they need it, as they need it, and, how, and have this as a continuous way in which the university functions. So this is used by a broader set of individuals on whose decision, uh, decisions the organization depends. Another definition is uh, as a process of capturing an organization's collective expertise, wherever it might reside. So in databases, on paper, in people's heads, and distributing it to, to wherever it can help produce the biggest payoff. So, so that is largely the, um, a broad definition of knowledge management. There are various definitions, but this is just uh, one or two examples of, of definitions. So what is knowledge? Any thoughts on what is knowledge? Well, it's different from information. So different from information. So what's the difference between information and knowledge? Since we are in a program in library and information science, I think of knowledge as analyzed information or somehow processed in a way that makes it more meaningful. So me it's meaningful. It's processed. Okay. Yeah. It's the decisions you make based on the information. So the decisions you make. So so it can help in in reaching decisions. It's, it's, it's processed in some manner. It's, it's, it's a body of decisions over time. Yeah. If you think analytically. Yeah. So Brenda Irwin um, is a researcher uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and she uh, has come up with uh, the sense-making theory. And Irwin says that uh, a lot of times when, when, say, I'm speaking to you right now, right, or anybody is, it's an instructor speaking to students, or or one person speaking to the other. So whenever we, we talk to other people, we try to assume that uh, people have, people's heads are empty buckets. Okay? And what I'm giving out uh, that in the form of information is bricks. And I throw that, uh, those bricks to people, and you're expected to catch it uh, in your heads. And that's the sort of uh, way we, in which people function in most communication, and trying to assume that people will catch uh, that information. And if you do not catch it, then you say that you have leaky buckets that your, your buckets are not good enough, or you have recalcitrant buckets in the sense that you repel what I'm trying to throw at you. And, and that is one of the fallacies with, with information. So when we think of uh, information, right, what I'm giving out to you right now it is not knowledge. I have knowledge inside me which I'm giving out to you, and that, that's information at that point. You are taking this information, putting it in your heads, connecting it with other pieces of, of knowledge and past experiences that you have had until this point, and that process of knowledge forming is happening in your minds. And over time, it becomes useful when you apply it in, in some way, you know, either to produce new knowledge or to the, make a decision which, which can help impact other people. So when, it, when knowledge, knowledge becomes useful when it reaches, uh, when it helps in decision making as we talked about. So there are various uh, levels. So people talk about data which is stored in, in databases. Uh, and we just talked about information. So even when you see something like printed something like this, right, or things in books, it, it doesn't mean anything. Sometimes when people ask us something, we say, go read this. And we are just giving them basically the piles of bricks, right, for, 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 for them to, 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 to go process, which is very difficult because we, we are not able to process a lot of information when we when you see it in this manner. And, and we can think of libraries uh, as information caves in that sense where, where there's a big pile of bricks. <laughs> and and we, are, we are expected to, to go process all those big bricks. It's only when you take a particular book, dive deeper into it, that's when you start making sense of it, and that's when, you, when you, the process of, of knowledge formation is happening in your minds at that moment. So we need to give in, people information in a way which they can process, and not just give information in forms which might be difficult to process. So here we, this is a hierarchy from data to information to knowledge, to wisdom, to truth. So people sometimes come up with uh, these various hierarchies. So when we talk about knowledge, uh, there is primarily two types of knowledge that the KM literature talks about. 
one is explicit and what is the other is tacit. So explicit knowledge is knowledge which has been codified in some form. So when you write a document or when you write a research paper, when I have PowerPoint slides, all those pieces of information are what I've taken, taken what I had in my mind and put it out there. So that is explicit. But this is just the tip of the, the iceberg in the sense that it is only what you see on the surface. There is much more that is there in people's minds with which they are not able to, uh, to speak out. So Polanyi was a researcher who talked about this idea of tacit knowledge in the 60s. And he said that we, we, can, uh, we know much more than what we can tell. And, and, and that's the main idea that we have much more information uh, within ourselves. So the goal of knowledge management is to look at this process of conversion from explicit to tacit or from tacit to explicit. And also not just to tap the explicit part, but also to, to, to tap as much as, as this part as possible. So if you convert more and more of the tacit to explicit, that becomes, that's good for the organization because it becomes part of the organizational asset. So let's say I'm giving this talk and this talk is being recorded. So that becomes part of uh, Simmons corporate asset in, the, in, in that sense. So, so, so the, the idea is recording is one way of, uh, in, of knowledge capture. Where you can have various tools and other people can access it, even those who could not be there for the talk today can access that and it becomes uh, much more accessible to people. So, so that's one, one of the ways in which uh, knowledge management works, where you, where you have various tools and strategies and a systematic processes by which uh, you can streamline this process of knowledge uh, capture, knowledge creation, knowledge sharing, and knowledge, knowledge use. So, yeah, so 80 to 85 percent of the knowledge that people have in their minds is tacit, but a very small percentage which is captured either in books or documents or files on a computer, and, and that is uh, explicit. So in knowledge management basically consists of something called the KM cycle or knowledge cycle, and uh, people try to talk about various things that happen in knowledge management. So how do you capture knowledge? So that, that primarily works for tacit knowledge. So this recording is one way of capturing tacit knowledge. And also the process of knowledge creation. So how do you create no new knowledge? And brainstorming is, is one way where you have groups uh, sitting together, focus groups, or communities of practice. All of those people coming together to create something new, or even individuals create new knowledge. And knowledge codification is the process uh, of organizing knowledge. And when you take uh, what, is the, what is out there and try, you try to make it organize it in a way in which it can be easily processed and accessed. Uh, and that is uh, where knowledge codification comes in. So when we talk about information organization and uh, taxonomies uh, and classification, so library information science plays, plays a very important role in this part of uh, knowledge management. And a lot of times, if you have to summarize uh, knowledge management in one word, it could be knowledge sharing. That's like a big chunk of uh, what people understand when you talk about knowledge management. You want to create a culture where people feel free to share most of the time. And, and when you create a knowledge sharing culture, this is like a huge chunk of, of the whole idea of knowledge management, even though we have the other areas. So when this, this piece is there, all the, a lot of the other pieces fall into place. So knowledge sharing, then individually you access the knowledge that is shared, and then you apply, and then you decide to use or to reuse it. And sometimes you also need to decide to divest, that, that is to get rid of knowledge that you do not need anymore. So that is um, knowledge reuse or, or divesting. So there, there can be various uh, <coughs> steps to knowledge uh, game cycle. Different people have come up with various typologies uh, for creation, acquiring, compiling, capturing, refining, storing. <coughs> and uh, Dalkir, in, in her book, she tried to the, sum, sum it up into three things as knowledge capture and creation as, as one part of knowledge management, and the second part as uh, knowledge sharing or dissemination, and either knowledge acquisition or use or knowledge application and, and use as the, as the third part. So for each of these steps of the, of the knowledge cycle, we need to think about what type of knowledge or skill is involved, say for knowledge capture or for knowledge sharing. And what is the use up to the college or the university for that knowledge? And what is the constraint that prevents the knowledge from being fully utilized? So that is where, where you need to start uh, identifying the barriers that are preventing that knowledge from being fully utilized in that context. 
and it can be for a specific department or unit within Simmons, let's say, or for the college as a whole, depending on whatever your strategic goals are. And one of the opportunities or alternatives that you have to manage that knowledge, and what is, what is the expected value added by improving the situation in that case. So various people have come up with different kinds of uh, models to, to talk about knowledge management. So this is a famous model by Nonaka and Takeuchi. So they have this, this, this known as a spiral model, and they have this, these four quadrants where you have tacit and ex then explicit, the two types of, on both the sides of this quadrant. So if you want to convert tacit knowledge to tacit knowledge, that means that what I know in my head, if I want to transfer to in your head, right? So tacit is what resides in my head in tap, and if, if it needs to go from one head to the other, then you socialize. So, so you need to create ways uh, and avenues for people to socialize, and this can be done very effectively. Uh, recently, the provost started uh, a lunch for faculty where every Wednesday, from, from 11 to 1, faculty could, could gather and, and have lunch, and that's a great way of uh, creating uh, means of socialization and to have transfer of, of tacit knowledge. And in those informal lunches that people could talk about uh, what do they want, uh, what kinds of research areas people are working on, or what, or what teaching strategies you need, what textbooks are you using. And, and, and that really helps uh, in, in brainstorming new ideas and collaborating. Okay. And even when you're mentoring or coaching, you can use uh, the, this quadrant. And if you are converting from tacit knowledge to explicit, so if what you know, if you want to convert it in the forms of, of books or manuals, if you want to record it, uh, then you do the, then you share your knowledge or, and, or then you capture it. So you can write uh, research papers or, or you can, the documents you create, the PowerPoint slides, the syllabus, all of those are various ways of uh, capturing. Even when you work on your assignments as students, that is a, a method of converting from tacit to explicit. And then if you convert from explicit to explicit, which means that you have something written and then you want to, to organize it, so you can classify, you can, you, can, you can make it easier to process, you can summarize, you can come up with a table of contents, so all of those are means to, to make explicit knowledge easier to, to process and organize. And finally, the, this happens, uh, conversion from explicit to tacit happens, let's say, when you read a book. Right, so, so it's when you're reading a book or, the, or an article on your own. So you're trying to understand it, you're trying to learn and, and introspect. So knowledge management happens in, in all of these stages. And each of these are important and we need to, to streamline processes whereby there, are, there is a lot of, uh, not that these things don't happen on, that, on their own, they happen all the time, but to recognize the importance of it and to provide various avenues to, to make it happen in a more systematic manner. So for instance, if you have uh, let's say faculty that are working in various, in a common area or common research expertise, so you put them together. So just in the, in the process of, uh, of, of trying to the, come to the offices, they can just meet and, and talk about it and, and collaborate in a, in a more effective manner. If you want to promote interdisciplinary research, then you put two people in different disciplines together in that sense. So, so lots of small, simple things can be done to, to help facilitate uh, this process. So, th so this is a sort of a spiral model, so this kind of uh, continues. So here you have a tacit to tacit, and then tacit to explicit, and then uh, explicit to explicit, transfer, and then uh, explicit to tacit. So you're tr here you're trying to come up with new ideas, here you're trying to process something in your brain, and then you're converting to documents or books or tapes. So there have been other models. There's a model by the European Foundation for Quality. And uh, they talk about what are the key enablers for knowledge management to work. So you need to have effective leadership. So if the top management recognizes the value of KM, it, it is much more effective and much easier to, to be done. So that it, it's kind of a, of a key role. The people must be receptive to knowledge management and the tools that you choose for it. You must have the right policy and the reward structure. That, so you must be rewarded for sharing. And, and there must be incentives built into, into that. And you might you need to have partnerships and resources and effective processes for it. And then you need to, uh, a way to measure the results as well, the performance indicators, where you have uh, people's uh, performance and society has, has uh, key measures. 
And uh, this is another model uh, for knowledge management, and this is by the Inukshuk. And what he did was that uh, he has combined Nonaka and Takeuchi's uh, spiral model over here in between. So the tacit and explicit. And you're taking uh, these four parts. The socialization was for, from tacit to tacit, the, post, the four quadrants over here. And then uh, he has seen these as important pillars. So leadership is very, very important in knowledge management. Technology is important. You need to have the technology infrastructure to make this possible. You need a knowledge sharing culture. Culture is a huge piece. A lot of times there are controversies as to, it's like a chicken and egg problem, that if you have a knowledge sharing culture in your organization, a sharing culture, then knowledge management succeeds. So if that is true, or does knowledge management make you help enable a knowledge sharing culture? Which one comes first? That is a, a, some sort of a, a, of a dilemma, but a lot of times if you have a sharing culture, then KM is much more likely to succeed. But if you do not, then you, you can implement various lower levels of knowledge management where you don't go the full extent, but you, you can decide. But whatever the culture is, you need to understand your culture first. So what, are the, what is the culture, what, is the, what are the barriers, and then decide on a, on a knowledge management strategy accordingly. And then you also need to have uh, measurement, because there is the knowledge-based theory of the firm, which sees that uh, Knowledge is a very important or the most important resource in, 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 our, in an organization. So a lot of business organizations uh, try to think in terms of profit and loss. So what is the return on investment if you're investing time and effort and money on something? So even in terms of knowledge management, you need to have effective measures of how do you measure the value of, uh, of, what, of, of how effectively are you able to capture knowledge, how effectively are you able to share, how does it help in decision making. So you need to come up with short term and long term goals and, and, and ways to measure the the degree of success. So, so that's a, the key important part because one of the things that I'd like to say is that we should not use the, that the word knowledge management might not be effective. Rather, if you just go and talk to people saying that how can I make your life easier? That is what knowledge management is about. But, but it, it, that people understand it much more than because I, it is about creating a, a sharing culture and organization where everyone feels valued and everyone can reach out to anyone else for help and support. So, so, and when that happens, your life becomes easier. You, know, you, you feel much, much more at home. So that's really what knowledge management is about. But when you use the term knowledge management, then people might not understand it, or it might seem like a very big term at that point. So we'll go to the problem uh, that this talk is trying to tackle, which is in the context of uh, colleges and, and universities. So the primary problem is that uh, most colleges and universities have a lack of effective uh, knowledge management, but they don't have a sound strategy to, uh, to talk about it or don't have a dedicated KM team. So the, we can think of universities as loosely coupled uh, organizations where you have uh, some sort of a central leadership, but you also have uh, various colleges uh, or schools within that university. And these schools are kind of autonomous organizations within that larger organization. And while some of the and there's a constant uh, sort of a pull and push beyond should you have an organization-wide policy or college-wide policy versus should different schools and departments be autonomous and being able to do things on their own. And uh, so, so there is this uh, pressure coming in from both the sides uh, at different points in time, which makes it uh, more like an organized anarchy, as per Cohen, uh, Marsh, and Olson. And also that uh, at any point in time, but especially now, Colleges uh, are grappling with change. Uh, there is competition uh, from other places. Uh, students have much more, many more options now with online programs being offered in different places. So their geographical base is shifting. Uh, the college fees is going high and uh, with, with a lot of uh, income reducing or people that might be having a difficult economic situation, then uh, students are struggling with to, to pay the fees. So you have a situation whereby you need to provide uh, student loans in order to attract students. And the more you start uh, providing loans, then your uh, operational budget decreases. And over a period of time, it becomes difficult to, to, to manage uh, the college or the university in order to, that it is sustainable and profitable. You need to identify areas where the college can continue to grow, areas where you need to, to cut the costs. So ensuring financial stability is important, but also ensuring the growth. So the business of colleges and universities is primarily to, to teach and create an, 
an environment for for the for sharing of knowledge, right, and and for learning. So that is that has to be the primary primary goal, and that has to be maintained. Uh, you need to be able to retain students. Uh, you need to ensure a high ranking in order to attract quality students and quality faculty in your college. And to do that, you need to have a lot of publications going on. You need to have a great infrastructure, a great student-centeredness in the way you operate. So a lot of things need to be in place, which is a constant challenge in trying to maintain. Then you have these massive open online courses opening up now, which are providing high-quality courses for free. So how does that? How do colleges and universities with charge of fee to, from students uh, tackle with that? And what does that mean in the long run? And then you have students uh, whose ways of learning are changing, so you have increasingly uh, increased amount of learning and interaction happening in the mobile and tablet environment. How to take that into consideration in your teaching and learning? So also there is a huge duplication of effort. So when you have faculty teaching uh, the same course, similar courses or different sessions of a course, a lot of times you find that they don't talk to each other or don't talk to each, each other as much as they should be talking. Or full-time faculty do not talk to adjunct faculty as much. So you have different faculty members, different people trying to redo the same things over and over again, rather than having a mechanism where what, what you have discovered you can easily share with other colleagues uh, in a seamless manner. And you can reuse uh, things that which one person comes up with. Uh, the tenure journeys are, are largely solitary, so we, where you have uh, five to six years to try and create an impact. And uh, in that, what happens is that a lot of you, times you might have uh, reward structures with which are like uh, emphasis on solo, solo authored articles, which again inhibits uh, collaboration. Also, the, even within the, a place like Simmons, you might not know what some other faculty member is an expert on. Say you need help with a particular method of data analysis or use with SPSS or MVO, a particular tool and you're not very clear that who has expertise in that area. Because what a website shows you is just an expertise which was listed four or five years ago when a faculty member might have joined. And your expertise is something which changes all the time as you work on something, you develop new expertise, so you need a much more uh, organized structure to make that happen. And uh, at Simmons, we also do not have an open access repository. That if we have one, but, but nobody uses it. So the, the idea is that if, you have, if you're coming up with your research publications, you just list up some of so they're saying that so-and-so faculty member presented something, but you, do, but you do not know what the presentation was all about. So if it was transferred to a repository, then people could go in and click and see it, or read the paper right away. So there are lots of uh, places where, where this can be improved in terms of uh, uh, trying to better manage uh, knowledge. So we do have an opportunity, and not just an opportunity, pretty much a requirement now, to become more agile, more much more responsive, smart universities, uh, so that you are able to, to deal with all kinds of changes that are happening, respond to student needs, and, and continue to, to change in a manner without uh, losing what you're good at, but also adapting to things where you can improve. So the problem that we're trying to, to solve here is that how can colleges and universities successfully implement KM? What are the steps to follow, and in what sequence? So there have been a few uh, implementation models uh, which can be adapted uh, in this study. Uh, one famous model is uh, by APQC, which is uh, the American, uh, let me see the, I think it's the American Productivity and Quality Center. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what they have come up with is, is a series of steps uh, to implement knowledge management. And they, the first step they have is a call to action, and where you get a, the business buy-in, where you get the top people to, to buy in the idea of knowledge management, where you talk about the value proposition, why do we even want knowledge management, what do we hope to get out of it. And then uh, you, you decide on the, on the direction that you want to take. You identify what is the critical knowledge, you align the knowledge management to business priority, priorities and functions. And then you come up with a roadmap and a strategy. So you develop, a, a, you first determine what is the current state, how is knowledge sharing happening, to, to what level, and, and how can it be better leveraged and organized. You create a governance framework, you need to have a team in place, and you design a phased implementation uh, plan. 
and you create business cases and budgets and you prioritize things. And then the, the third step is your design and, and implementation steps where you come up with uh, plans for project infrastructure, you come up with a budget and implementation. And here you design the knowledge flow processes, the approaches and develop measures and plans. And finally, the, once the, the knowledge management has been implemented in some unit or a pilot has been done, then you decide on a plan to how to evolve it and why and how to sustain it over time. Another model was by the Alvarenga, Neto, the, and his colleagues, who came up with something called the SET model, which is Strategy, Environment, and Toolbox. So the strategy might be, what is it that you want to do? So we talked about the phases of the, of the KM cycle. So here it talks about sense making as one part of, part of what you want to do. Knowledge creation, which is organization learning and unlearning for the potential to act. That is one. Or decision making. So depending on uh, what you want, to, which phase of the knowledge cycle you want to focus on at what point, you can decide on uh, the, the first part of the strategy. And then you need uh, to have something called uh, BAR, which is an enabling context. So this BAR is a, is a term which you largely used, I think this was originated in Japan. And the idea is to have an enabling context. What are the set of conditions you need to be in place, to have in place before you can have effective knowledge management? So he, he lists things like tolerance to honest mistakes, and the creation of meeting and sharing organizational spaces. You need to have all the spaces created. Like, when you, let's say you have you talk even in the design of buildings where you have uh, hallways, right? <coughs> hallways are not very really conducive to knowledge sharing. But if you have a, a building designs where you have a com more common space where people are sitting and then you have rooms around it that can have a much more natural environment of sharing. Classrooms without wheels, uh, with chairs without wheels, right? So if you have chairs in a classroom, that becomes a much natural way for people to to form small groups in a much more natural manner to have a classroom in uh, classes in circles. And uh, you can also have uh, classrooms fitted with uh, technology such that people can call in right now. So we could have mechanisms where people are in this room listening to this talk, but other people could be connecting it remotely. So, so all of those are, are, are simple things which can be done to have this greater culture of knowledge sharing. So again, uh, care, trust, commitment, lenience in, in judgment. So there is no loss of status for not knowing everything. That is very, very important when you talk about creating a knowledge sharing culture. Openness to new ideas and innovation. Yeah. Creative chaos. So even though you're not organized, but you're always trying to, to come up with new things. Autonomy, empowerment, physical layouts. All of these are, which is, are what constitutes the bar or the enabling conditions. And then you have a various sets of tools uh, which can be created for knowledge sharing. Uh, so the spaces for face-to-face -face interaction, um, information management and systems. So I've written another paper with a co-author on sets of tools which can be implemented, and that's for a library context and how, we, how can knowledge management be done in libraries and what are the tools needed. So that is more looking at the, the technology and non-technology based tools. So that's a separate part, which is just using a toolbox. <laughs> knowledge happy hour? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Naresh, what's the difference between the creative chaos of the BA and uh, the and the organized anarchy of the average American university. The the organized anarchy is, is not really a, a bad thing. It was just a definition of uh, of colleges and universities in terms of uh, how the researchers had tried to define it. But as long as you, it's a purposeful organized anarchy. Okay. That yeah. that you are meaning to to have it that way. And that you you have uh, autonomy within units, but you are also very free to share knowledge within those units, and that you have effective collaboration mechanisms at various stages. So, for instance, okay, yeah. So, so that that can be it. It had rather than just happening it, it has to be something that you that is desirable and that's what you want. So, I can sh I can decide what to share and what not to share on an individual basis with the team, then again within the department as a whole, within the co with the college as a whole, and with the wider world. So you can have set various levels and so that people can share things with people with the level of comfort that we, that they have. So th this is the kind of the model which I've implemented, adopted in this uh, study. And this is by Ojal and, and uh, Grayson. And it's a very simple model where you have uh, a value proposition that what is it that you want to get out of it. 
and then there are four steps, which is a plan, design, implement, and then scale up. In, in the way you want to implement knowledge management, and you need to have the enabling environment of the infrastructure, the, the technology, the culture, and and the measures. So once you have uh, these things in place and these four steps, is is what we are proposing in this uh, as a, for colleges and universities to follow. So in the proposed steps or template, uh, the steps that I list are meant to be iterative rather than sequential. And I'd also need your feedback on uh, if those steps make sense because I'm just going to send this paper to a journal. It's not been sent yet. So the idea of this talk was to get some feedback as well in terms of uh, whether, whether these steps make sense uh, or if you suggest any changes. So the first step uh, is, the, is the problem planning. So one of the first things is that you need to have some sort of a knowledge management team because everything re requires work. So you need to have a people who you, who you set out with, with the time allocated who can work on this. Okay. So we can talk about uh, colleges can decide whether it needs to be top down. But so usually, the, how much whether it's an imposed team or whether the team arises from the bottom up, it, it originates within departments. But you need top administration support. <clears throat> but the team can be composed of various people. It's good to have uh, representation from faculty and staff and students, uh, and, and also from different units. So the, or maybe somebody from the technology area as well, from the infrastructure. So once that team is in place, then you can start talking about and brainstorming strategies right from the beginning. And also what sort of budget uh, is, is there and what are the constraints in, in that area. So typically there are there will be th three kinds of people in, in any organization. There will be people who will be very enthusiastic and they, people who are likely to adopt new things very easily, the innovators. People uh, who will be very resistant to change and then people who are kind of mainstream who will follow through if they ask to. So you are, you are trying to look for the enthusiasts in, at this step, the, the, the people who are, who, are in, who are open to change to, to be a, a part of this team at this early juncture like when you're trying to, to set up this uh, TMT. And the next step, which is a very important step, is identifying the value proposition. Why do we want to manage uh, the knowledge? So is the goal to create uh, a conducive environment for knowledge uh, creation and, and capture, or is are we trying to make knowledge sharing a defining aspect of the, of the knowledge? Is is that a primary goal, or you want to apply the, the knowledge to decision making? So the when you're tr trying to come up with this value proposition, that is really really important. That and it must align with your larger goals. What where does the college want to be in five years from now? What is the strategy? Let's say Simmons had a strategy for 2015. Now we're talking about strategy 2020. So, so where do we want to go five years from now, or six years from now, and what is the unique value that, you, that separates you from other colleges and, and universities of your type or, or of your size? So that is the value proposition which must align with uh, knowledge management. So we need to align the KM goals with the mission, vision, and the goals of the university. So, and you also need to prioritize the goals for the shorter term and the longer term. What are the short term goals? Uh, Maybe the short-term goals is to, the, let's say, start a new unit, offer more online courses, might be the, depending on the, on the larger strategy. And you need to the map the, the, the KM goals with the larger, the, accordingly with the organizational goals. And the priorities might be very different uh, for different sized universities. Now, even for the same university, it might be very different at different points in time. So you need to decide what, what are priority, your priorities now. and. Uh, that has to be, and understanding yourself and your priorities is one of the first steps when you talk about knowledge management. And then we, talk, we need to talk about what does knowledge mean to us? Where does the knowledge reside? So first we need to start identify, identifying that do we have knowledge at Simmons? Yes or no? And if we do, where does it, it lie? Does it lie with the students? Does it lie with the staff? Does it lie with faculty? Where does it reside? In the heads? On the office computers? At homes? On Dropbox? Uh, or is it on the college website? And if it is, uh, what kind of knowledge are we, are we looking at uh, gathering or, or organizing or managing? So typically in a college context, there are two types of knowledge. There's operational knowledge, which can help improve the functioning and make your processes much more efficient. And also there's a scholarly knowledge, which you produce in terms of uh, new research that is produced. So what is the type of knowledge that you're seeking to manage or to improve? And what is the short-term priority, what is the long-term priority? So these questions cannot be answered by anybody else except for the people who are trying to manage because it has to be 
every college and, and university must sit down and, and try to come up with these answers. And the team can take play a leading role, a team that we had set up in the, in the front for this. So then again, uh, this model is, is just a guide as to which processes are we trying to streamline. And then you need to understand yourself. So this part can take a few months trying to understand what is the larger environment that you're operating in, what kind of constraints do you have, uh, what are the things happening, let's say, in the higher education sector in general, the, or, or in the financial uh, environment. And what kind of culture do you have in your college or university? Is it a pro-sharing culture, or is it an anti-sharing culture? And if it is, to what, to what extent? Which part of this continent does it lie? So I'm trying to understand that even within different units of the college or in different departments, that's important. And also, you need to have, uh, you need to understand the people. You need to try and get the top management support and the support of the president, the provost, all the people that, who are decision makers in a college setting, the trustees, and also within the deans and, and individual units and departments. But also uh, with individual faculty and students in terms of uh, are they open to sharing what they know or not? And what are the incentives that they have to share? For instance, if you change uh, a tenure policy that uh, most of the publications must be, let's say, co-authored papers, and one of, one or more paper must be from a, a co-authored with another faculty member within the college, that, that itself gives uh, an incentive. Or if you say that you must have at least one, one paper with a student, that, 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 that is an incentive to have a collaboration with the student. So you can, have, you can form policies which can, which can help uh, streamline this. And you need to understand the technology support that you have, the kind of infrastructure, and what are the things you need to put in place to help manage that. And also you need to do a knowledge audit, and to do a knowledge map as to decide that if I need information, who do I ask? Who do I go for information? What kind of information do I need on my day-to-day -day tasks? And uh, do I ask which colleagues do I reach out to? So how is knowledge flowing? You need to go interview people to find out that where are, where are, where are their information needs being met from? and who are the people they reach out to and, and in what frequency. And once you do that, you can map, make, make a map of your entire college. And that's where you, you identify the gaps and the holes, where one person is being utilized a lot, but there are other person's expertise which is not being utilized enough. And there are methods for this, social network analysis and other, other ways can be done to do this mapping. You can have surveys and focus groups and interviews at the stage. So this is a big part uh, when you're trying to assess yourself. And then you to, needed to understand the enabling conditions. Uh, what kind of culture do you follow? This is a matrix um, by Schneider who came up with uh, with a, with a reality-oriented versus possibility-oriented culture, or a people-oriented versus company-oriented culture. So we won't go into the each cell of the matrix, but but there were like depending on uh, where there's a focus on, you can have various kinds of culture in an organization. And then you need to have an, an infrastructure of peoples and policies uh, that would give you to, to understand that part of yourself. You need to understand the technology support that you have. And also, the, you need to come up with, with measures. Uh, what are the measures for success that you're looking at? So in the next stage, as we move from plan to design, you need to align the knowledge management strategy with the, with the university culture. So the, in, as per this framework by, by Quinn and Rohrberg, they came up with four kinds of cultures again, where there's a hierarchical culture, one that you are responding to the market or the competition, or where, one where you have uh, a clan. So the idea of a clan was a tightly connected organization that values teamwork, and people take care of each other, and mentorship plays an important role. And the best part was the Adocracy, which uh, is a creative and dynamic organization that enables innovations growth and gaining of new resources. So depending on what type of culture you, you're trying to understand that. And the idea is to align the, the, the university mission and goals with the university culture and the KM strategy. So these three must go hand in hand. If, if there's a gap in that, then something is wrong. So understanding uh, your, your own culture, understanding your laying out your mission and your goals in the short term and the long run, and then coming up with a strategy to, to match that. So when we talk about strategy, we're talking about a few things. We're talking about what are the managerial practices that are needed, what is the change needed over there, what is the change needed in the processes, what, how do we need to design or redesign the physical spaces, 
like uh, we it, at Gisthus, we now have a, a new collaboratory, and, and that that's a lot of new good things that can be done with that, and that's a kind of a, a physical space which can be done, uh, which can be very helpful in the enabling knowledge management. And what are the tools and policies you need, and what are the incentives or rewards you need for sharing? Also, distance incentives for not sharing. So so having that part. So depending on. Uh, on the culture, whether, whether it's anti-sharing or pro-sharing, you can move from various types of uh, strategies where you can have self-service, that means you can have a simple implementation where you just find things based on what's there in, in their insistence, or you can have a much more interact place where every now and then you go and, and map your lessons learned from everything that you do and map the, your best practices, or you can have uh, communities of practice where you're always seeking to transfer best practices, which is this is the best which happens if you have a pro-sharing culture. So depending on your culture, you can decide on the scale of implementation for KM. So set your priorities or scope for KM. So you can't manage everything, so you need to prioritize what you want, what you are seeking to prioritize. So align with your short-term and uh, long-term goals. So create choices rather than imposing solutions. Only if people the, themselves come up with things, with, are they likely to follow it. If somebody imposes solutions, then that's not likely to work uh, very well. So. The choice can be not uh, not based on whether you want to have knowledge management or not, but how do you want to have it, and to, and what level or extent. And this, so different units might decide to either implement or not implement. And and the one which way it's most likely to succeed, identify that as a site or a pilot, because that's that's a department or unit. If it works well over there, then it can be taken on the college wide. Design measures of success. Uh, how, do you, how would you measure the success for knowledge creation? How would you measure the success for knowledge sharing, for knowledge use? And then there are various uh, templates for these uh, which in the knowledge management literature which can be adapted to the college. And when it comes to implementation, uh, do a pilot. Start very small within a department or unit. And again, implementation applies to manager practices, processes, physical spaces, tools. What are the things that you need, need to change for that level? Uh, measure your success. And finally, we do a, do a scale up. So make changes to the strategy based on the file, what are the things that worked well, what are the things which didn't work well. Scale up to other departments or units. Come up with university-wide guidelines and also department-wide implementation. And have a, a wider infrastructure to support everyone. And have specific, you might have more, need, more teams needed at this stage. One for the entire college, but also for specific departments. And then you make any changes, uh, revise, measure, and then repeat. So the cycle sort of uh, carries on. And then look for ways to disseminate this widely to other universities or partners, or even to alumni or the government. So it can extend even beyond your college and university. So that was pretty much uh, it. I'm ready for, for questions. <coughs> What are some examples of knowledge management systems that you may have encountered in your research that might be good examples to follow for universities? Um, I have a, I actually pulled this out because I thought there could be a question on that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a paper where I have, um, along with my co-author, we've listed out various tools for, uh, for knowledge management. So we have tools for knowledge creation and capture tools for knowledge sharing and dissemination and tools for knowledge application and use. So this is a whole, uh, this is a tool for knowledge creation and capture. So these tools are for coming up with uh, mental models or concept maps, action learning, ad hoc sessions, uh, after action reviews, brainstorming. So these are various tools and what these tools do, do over here. Knowledge Cafe, Knowledge Marketplace, Learning History. And then these are technology-based tools where you have screen sharing, remote support, collaborative visual learning, collaborative, collaborative writing, wikis. And then uh, there are tools for knowledge sharing and, and dissemination. Again, collaborative physical spaces, communities of practice. All of these are for, for sharing. And social network analysis, storytelling. And these are technology-based tools for sharing. And then finally, the tools for uh, not non-technology tools for application and use, trying to find out what your personality type is so that you, the knowledge can be mapped according to you, 
and then doing a knowledge audit, personalization and profiling, learning reviews, and then technology-based tools to, uh, to also help. So this is a kind of a wide range of choices which I've, which I've tried to put over here so that people can pick and choose things which uh, best apply to your needs. Would you consider an uh, institutional uh, repository, like a, an online one, to be another? Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent tool and uh, greatly needed. I think greatly needed at Simmons especially. So we, if you have an open access repository, what I uh, envision is that any, any research which, which any faculty member across Simmons comes up with, right now we just have a small news article saying that this faculty member published something. But rather than just publishing it, if, if it does a precondition <coughs> saying that we will, not, we will not publish this news until and unless you share this in the repository first, Share this, share this in the repository and provide us a link. And that link becomes part of the publication. So that not only can you read about what somebody has done, but then you can go click on it and go deeper into the, in what someone has done. So that will give you a lot of ideas into what sorts of collaborations are needed and to move forward. And any other question? Yeah. Uh, in terms of incentives in an academic setting. So traditionally, in public schools, say, tenured school teachers you know, at the secondary school level are regarded sometimes as dead wood or not creative. They're, they're settled. They don't have to worry about their future. They're not going to be creative. But in a college setting, university setting, where people's uh, status is uncertain, or now with MOOCs, where entire areas of research may be uncertain because there's going to be something out there that's going to replace that area of research, how do you provide the incentives to staff that may be moving through the system and not Secure. I, I think Simmons has taken some steps towards that. One is that for tenured faculty, there's something called PDMYR, Periodic Developmental Multi-Year Review, I think. So even after you get a tenure, you can go through that, and within six years, you can apply to be a, a, a full professor. So that's, but you do have to go through that review after three or six years, I think. So that's one thing. And also, the, the other thing which I believe uh, will be done is that there is a mentorship model which is very, very effective. in having uh, senior faculty mentor junior faculty in terms of uh, having regular meetings for research. But that mentorship might also be extended to tenured faculty. Because just because you've gotten a tenure doesn't mean that you don't need a mentor. And your, your peer or colleague can be a mentor, or even a junior faculty can be a mentor for a senior faculty, I think. It's just a matter of being, uh, being answerable to somebody, somebody, and that really helps keep you on track. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much.